Hey scholars, welcome back. We're moving on to chapter five of The Iron Dragon Never Sleeps. So Winnie is learning more about the celestial um, Chinese customs. So um, about how the emperor in China made it against the law for the Chinese to cut their hair so the boy would wear his braid up in a coil around his head so that when he was working his hair wouldn't get caught. Also, um, they learned that the Chinese take baths every night. So, um, that's interesting. And they drink lukewarm tea while working in really hot conditions. Hmm. Okay. Chapter 5. Cisco may not have been pretty, but it was a busy place. A train from Sacramento arrived each day. It was met there by the Overland Mail Stagecoach and various freight wagons from Nevada. Her father had told Winnie that stagecoaches would soon be a thing of the past. The railroads would chase them into the woods, he had said, and they won't ever come back. Winnie wanted to get down to get Winnie wanted to get one down on paper before they disappeared. So one morning she sat sat down outside the general store and sketched the stagecoach across the street. Her first picture made the wheels too big. She put it down and started another. I wish I could draw like that. Winnie looked up. Oh, she said, where did you come from? She was speaking to a girl about her own age who was standing beside behind her. I came on that stagecoach you're drawing. The girl answered, what's your name? Winnie, Winnie Tucker. Nice to meet you, Winnie. I'm Jane Poole. Do you live here? Just for the summer. I'm from Sacramento. Jane sighed. It made her freckles crease. Ah, we're moving to Portland, she said. Portland, Oregon? Jane nodded. My father works for a lumber company there. He went on ahead two months ago. Now he's sent for us. My brother, my mother, and me. We came from Omaha, from Kansas City. She closed her eyes. That was four very bumpy weeks ago. My father says that once the railroad is finished, people will travel from Omaha to San Francisco in five days. How does your father know that? He works for the railroad company, said Winnie. Jane nodded. See those two men? She pointed down the street. I think they would work for the railroad company too. Here's the two men. Winnie saw two strangers walking past the storish, storage sheds of railroad supplies. They were with us on the stagecoach from Omaha, Jane explained. They bragged a lot about how important they were to the railroad there. The Union Pacific. Hey, Jane, a boy called to her. Jane sighed. That's my brother, Johnny. Johnny ran headlong into the street and was almost hit by a passing wagon. The driver of one of the railroad cooks yelled at him in Chinese. Johnny yelled back. Did you see that? He asked Jane. That old man almost ran me down. You jumped out in front of him said Winnie. Johnny looked a lot like his sister, but with more freckles and sandy hair. He was about eight, she reckoned. No, I didn't, he said. It was all his fault. If those Chinese opened their eyes wider, they would probably see better, and they should cut their hair, too. They can't help their hair, said Winnie. The emperor makes them wear it that way. What emperor? The one back in China, she explained about the emperor. Johnny was not impressed. I wouldn't let any emperor make me look like a girl. He stared at Winnie. Who are you anyway? Winnie Tucker. Well, wh what are you defending the Chinese for? You don't look Chinese. I'm not. Still, he, he was right. She had defended them. Winnie wasn't sure why. In the past, she had hardly thought about the Chinese. They were just the celest celestials, but Lee was a real person. 
He got thirsty and made jokes. He worried about getting in trouble. Meeting him made her feel a little different. Where's Mother? Jane asked. In the general store. The train doesn't leave for a while yet. Let's play hide and seek. He looked at Winnie. She can play too. All right, said Winnie. Jane smiled. Since it was your idea, Johnny, you can be it. Count to twenty. And remember, no peeking. All right. One, two, three. Jane motioned for Winnie to follow her. They darted across the street and ducked behind the stagecoach. Quick, Jane whispered. Get inside. Winnie opened the door, and they both climbed in. The stagecoach smelled of dirt and old leather. You'll never think to look here, Jane whispered. Shh, someone's coming. Footsteps stopped outside. Did you have any luck? said the man, said a man's hoarse voice. Winnie pressed back against the stagecoach seat. She could see the back of the man's head outside the window. I talked to a few. I don't think the Chinese trusted me. The hoarse man laughed. I wouldn't trust you myself. You haven't changed your clothes in a week or bathed in a month. He spit on the ground. But they've got eyes, don't they? Even if they are slanty, they see what's going on. They have to pay for their own food. They don't get promoted. And they get all the dangerous jobs to boot. I don't think they'll stand for it for much longer. I'll drink to that. Come on. There must be some whiskey in this rat hole of a town. And they walked away up the street. Can you believe that, said Jane? Imagine talking with some Chinese. She shuddered. I've met a Chinese boy who works for the railroad, said Winnie. He seems nice enough. That's hard to believe, Winnie. I mean, they're so strange. How do you know if you've never talked to one? Jane fidgeted with her, with her frock. Well, I just do, that's all. Jane! Johnny! Jane sighed. Ugh, that's, my, my, that's mother. I guess we better go. They climbed out of the stagecoach. I'll have to help Mother find Johnny. He could be anywhere looking for us. Goodbye, Winnie. If you're ever in Port Portland, look for me. Goodbye, Jane. I hope you like the train ride. Winnie watched Jane and her mother head for the station. She wondered how many people thought about the Chinese the way that Jane did. New friend. Winnie turned as... Flapjack came up beside her. Not exactly, she said. Just someone I met. She doesn't much care for the Chinese. She has lots of company, said Flapjack. And we heard these me two men talking. They didn't like the Chinese either. But they seem to think the Chinese are important. Well, they are, at least to the railroad. Burt's told me the railroad has 10,000 celestials on the payroll. Well, these men were talking about the railroad and the celestials. They talked like the Chinese were being taken advantage of. Flapjack frowned. Who were these fellows? Jane said they worked for the Pacific Union, or the Union Pacific. Hmm, that's the company building the railroad west of Omaha. They'd like to see the Central Pacific have trouble with the Chinese. Truth is, the Chinese crews are the best the railroad has. So if the Union Pacific caused trouble with the Chinese, said Winnie, that would slow down the Central Pacific a bit. I expect so. I expect so, said Flapjack. Winnie was confused. But wouldn't that hurt the Union Pacific too? I mean, wouldn't they... Wouldn't the completion of the railroad be delayed? Maybe, said Flapjack, but it could be worth it. You see, Winnie, both companies are laying track in a kind of a race. The Union Pacific is building west from Omaha. The Central Pacific is building east from Sacramento. Somewhere in Utah or Nevada, the two railroads will meet. Winnie shook her head. Why does it matter where they meet? 
When they're done, it'll still be one railroad joined together. Flapjack smiled. Ah, uh, that's true for the passengers, but there's more at stake than that. The government gives land to a railroad for each mile of track it lays. The more track a railroad puts down, the more land it collects. And someday that land will be worth plenty. Winnie nodded slowly. Well, she said, I guess building a railroad is more complicated than I thought. All right, I'll see you back here for chapter six. Bye, scholars.